Okay, good morning, guys. So let's uh, start today's class. Today we are going to talk about psoriasis, one of the very very important topic in the field of dermatology. This is a big topic. So if I can finish this in time, then I'll start another one uh, that is vitiligo. Okay, let's see. We have enough classes to finish all these lectures. So psoriasis <clears throat> is a chronic multifactorial inflammatory disease of the skin where keratinocytes are hyperproliferating. There is excessive proliferation of the keratinocyte and that results in increased epidermal turnover. So what does that mean? This is a chronic disease. It has a lot of remission and relapses. And this is one of the skin disease which is difficult to treat. In this condition, the keratinocytes which are present in the epidermis are over proliferating. So the uh, life cycle of these skin cells or keratinocytes are decreased. Okay, means they turn over very rapidly. And as a result of that, there is a lot of scales or flick formation on the surface. This results in a typical plaque formation, which has a silver color. Okay, color. It's a silver color plaque. If we remove that plaque, the underlying surface is erythematous as a result of inflammation. These all are very, very important features of psoriasis. This disease is a multifactorial you know, pathophysiology. Uh, some genetic predisposition is there, but at the same time, environmental factors also play a big role. And this is a chronic disease, which course is very unpredictable. So you cannot really tell that to the patient party that yes, you are going to be, get better very soon because after some time, the disease may come back again. So counseling has to be appropriate and it has a lot of remission and relapse. Remission means state of cure. Relapse means the disease will come back again. Now look at this picture. Yesterday already we, we, we saw this picture. Okay, see here, uh, these are the psoriatic plaque. This type of, you know, uh, skin disease, okay, or the morphology of this skin disease is called plaque because the breadth or width is much more than the height. And it has a typical color. This is known as silver color plaque. The underlying surface is red. You can see this, okay. And there is some area of hemorrhage also present. Especially if we scratch this area, then slight amount of bleeding point are very, very common. Let's move on. Now, regarding the epidemiology of uh, psoriasis, it is a common type of skin disorder, okay? Uh, it is equally common in both male and female, and the estimated incidence is 60 per 100,000 people per year. Regarding the age of onset, the mean age of onset is 23 to 37 year, okay? But it clearly has got two distinct peak. Now, the early onset occurs at the age of 16 to 22 years, whereas the late onset occurs at 57 to 60 years. These are called the two distinct peak. Okay. Early onset is more commonly associated to have a first degree family member, means it runs in the family. And the late onset doesn't have that type of association. And both of these are having a strong connection with the genetic predisposition. Now, regarding the pathophysiology of uh, psoriasis, now see here, it is a complex multifactorial disease, which appears to be influenced by genetic and immune mediated component. So genetic component uh, plays a very strong role here. All, all people you know, will not develop psoriasis. Only those people who are predisposed genetically will develop. On top of that, there should be some environmental factors role as well. This is supported by the successful treatment of psoriasis with immune mediating biological medication. At the end of today's topic, when we talk about the treatment or management part, you will understand this very easily. There are so many medicines which are either immunosuppressive drug or immune modulating drug. Okay, so that clearly tells us that uh, there is a role of immune mediated mechanism for psoriasis. Pathogenesis of this disease is not completely understood. 
So there are certain hypotheses or theories exist. Multiple theories tell us, okay, there are some triggering factor for psoriasis like infection, traumatic insult, and stressful life event. So we are including this or discussing this under etiology. What are those infection? What are those traumatic insult and stressful life event that can result in psoriasis? Once triggered by these, you know, uh, triggering agent, there appears to be substantial leukocyte recruitment to the dermis and epidermis, which result in characteristic psoriatic plaque. And this results in inflammation also. So there are two to three things which are very important here. One, the person should be genetically predisposed. Second, there should be some triggering factors, maybe infection, maybe some stressful life event, or maybe some trauma to the skin, which results in recruitment of the leukocyte on the skin. And after some time, the psoriatic plaque will form. And this is helped by the immune mediated process. Now, see here, epidermis is infiltrated by a large number of activated T cells here. Okay, these are activated T cell. And these activated T cell will induce keratinocyte proliferation, which is a hallmark of psoriasis. Excessive proliferation of keratinocyte, the turnover of this keratinocyte is massively increased. The inflammatory process occurs with a large production of various cytokines by these activated T cell, like tumor necrosis factor alpha, okay, interferon gamma, and interleukin 12. These are some of the important ones. These elevated levels of tumor necrosis factor alpha specifically are found to correlate with the flares of psoriasis. Flare means, you know, increase in cl clinical features. The, the lesion which are present in the skin have increased in severity, that is called flaring. And during this time, if we measure the level of tumor necrosis factor alpha, it is specifically high. So there is a good correlation between the severity of the disease and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Now the key finding in the affected skin of patient with psoriasis include vascular engorgement due to superficial blood vessel dilation. And as a result of this vascular engorgement, remember there is auspid sign present, okay? Auspid sign, we'll talk about that a bit later in the clinical feature. When, when we scratch that, uh, you know, uh, psoriatic lesion, there will be pinpoint hemorrhage in the underlying area. And this pinpoint hemorrhage is because of the rupture or damage to the superficial dilated blood vessel. And this can be utilized as one of the important diagnostic feature of psoriasis. At the same time, there is alteration in the epidermal cell cycle. Now, we all know the life span of this uh, epidermal cell or keratinocyte may range from two weeks to one month, okay? Or approximately three weeks, it is written here. From three weeks or about 23 days, it will drop to three to five days. Now you can, uh, you know, understand how, you know, fast these cells are turning over here. And when cells are turning over this fast, remember, from the basal layer of the epidermis, they're quickly moving towards the superficial layer of the epidermis. So there is formation of a lot of fleck. And this is what we see in psoriasis. Let's move on. Now, let's talk about the etiology of psoriasis. The cause is unknown, however, Environmental factors, genetic factors, and immunological factors appear to play a role. Okay, now let's see what are those. Regarding the environmental factors, okay, these are the factors which trigger exacerbation of the psoriatic plaque. And these are cold exposure, okay, trauma, and infection like streptococci, staphylococci, and HIV. These are very commonly associated. Along with that, alcohol and some of the drugs like iodide, okay, 
steroid withdrawal, use of aspirin, lithium, beta blocker, and even anti-malarial drug. Now, they are acting like a precipitating factor or exacerbating factor for psoriatic plaque appearance or development. Okay, so this is the one point here. But remember, these people should be genetically predisposed. Now, uh, I should uh, explain a little bit more here. These are the very important drugs which are used in uh, clinical practice for different diseases, isn't it? Please don't think like that. Use of aspirin is associated with psoriasis development. This is not the point which I'm explaining here. Those patients should be genetically predisposed, okay, for the development. Then only it can exacerbate. That is the reason. Hot weather, sunlight, and pregnancy may be beneficial, although the latter is not universal. So, uh, exactly opposite to that, isn't it? Appearance of cold is exacerbating factor, but hot weather and sunlight are the beneficial one. That's why we often counsel these patients to expose themselves in the sunlight, okay, uh, regarding the treatment. Especially when they appear, apply cold tar, they should expose themselves to the sunlight. This is one of the management. Stress can exacerbate psoriasis. Some authors suggest that psoriasis is a stress-related disease and offer findings of increased concentration of neurotransmitter in psoriatic plaque. So this is the evidence, okay? Stress uh, is leading to uh, increased exacerbation of the disease. Means if the person is, uh, you know, having a stressful life, then the control of the psoriatic plaque is difficult situation. That is the meaning. There is a important type of phenomena, which is known as Kovner phenomena. This is quite important question from the exam point of view. Kovner phenomena, what is the meaning? The appearance of psoriatic lesion in previously uninvolved areas after irritation or trauma is known as Kovner phenomena. Remember, this patient is already genetically predisposed. So when, when the patient had trauma, to the other uninvolved area of the skin, or patient is having scratches there or something like that, then similar type of lesion may appear in that damaged or scratch or trauma area. This is known as Kovner phenomena. Now, what are the genetic factors? Okay, those are responsible. See here, these are the genetic factors. So patients with psoriasis have a genetic predisposition for the disease. So many times uh, I have uh, you know, discussed this thing. Psoriasis is associated with certain HLA allele, particularly human leukocyte antigen CW6. And in some family, psoriasis is running as autosomal dominant trait also. So just remember, nobody is going to ask you which HLA antigens are responsible there or alleles are responsible there is a role of genetic factors and it may run in certain family. Obesity is another factor which is associated with psoriasis, but we really do not know what is the connection between them, but onset or worsening of the psoriasis occurs with weight gain and improvement occurs with weight loss, okay? So this is clinically observed. That's why, okay, we, we, we believe obesity has a role to play. Now, what about the immunological factors? Now, we already uh, talked about these also. There is increase, you know, uh, a collection of tumor necrosis factor alpha during the exacerbation of psoriatic plaque. So this clearly tells us there is increased activity of the T cells, okay? So this is the immunological factor. And another immunological factor is explained by the treatment. During the treatment, we can use certain, you know, immunosuppressive drug. Another point here is, there is a form of psoriasis, which is known as gutted psoriasis, okay? A rather circular type of lesions are seen, a rounded lesions are seen in gutted psoriasis. We'll talk about this later. It often appears following certain immunologically active events like streptococcal pharyngitis, cessation of steroid therapy, 
and use of anti-malarial drug. So these are the precipitating factor of gutted type of psoriasis. And this also suggests there is a role of immunological mechanism here. Now, till now, what we have discussed is the etiopathogenesis of psoriasis. So genetic predisposition should be necessary. Environmental factors should play a role there. Okay. And immunological mediated mechanism is also important. Now, let's talk about what are the clinical presentation of psoriasis. So this is a clinical presentation of classic form of psoriasis, which is known as plaque psoriasis. See this? Now, the silver colored scale is not that very prominent like uh, the picture which you have seen the last time, but still, you know, still you can observe that. Probably uh, this patient has applied some emollients here because of the effect of the emollients, a lot of uh, flex, okay, have disappeared. And red looking area is seen, but still at the center, I can still see the silver colored uh, plaque. So the lesions are well-defined and sharply demarcated. These are well-defined lesions, okay? And sharply demarcated means the border can be seen very easily. They may be round or oval shaped lesion. It is typically a bit of oval shape, okay? But in gutted psoriasis, they are rounded also. They are usually symmetrical on both, both half of the body, they may be found. They may be erythematous, means red in color, a raised type of plaque, and they are covered by white silvery scale. Very, very typical feature of psoriasis. If these uh, plaques are not there, you know, we may confuse this with uh, even fungal infection or two other types of, you know, manifestation also like eczema. So there are so many differential diagnoses which exist in psoriasis. Okay, we'll talk about that later. Now see here, these are the common symptoms of psoriasis in the patient. Have a look here. So these are the most frequently experienced symptoms in the patient. Is scaling, okay? Is scaling or flecking is probably the most important one. And scaling or flecking is excessive in case of psoriasis. Another is itching, itching on this scale skin redness okay if especially specifically if we apply emollients uh, then underlying skin looks erythematous or red tightness of the skin patient may feel that bleeding when they scratch burning sensation fatigability and some other okay some other non-specific features patient may feel febrile also sometimes okay so these are the common symptoms of psoriasis. You don't need to remember this percentage, but just to make a concept here, which are more common. Now, okay, so psoriasis is a chronic disorder. And you know, it doesn't look good, isn't it? If, if a patient develops this big type of rashes on the skin, cosmetically, it doesn't look good. So because of this chronicity, and cosmetic you know, effect, patient is emotionally disturbed because of psoriasis. Now see that the patient, when we ask, you know, when we judge this patient or examine this patient, then patient have concern that the disease would worsen in almost 88% of the time. Patient has a feeling of embarrassment because of this disease. They uh, sometimes, you know, they even isolate themselves because of this embarrassment. They don't want to go to the public. They don't want to show their lesion to their friends or colleagues. So they are socially isolated because of this, okay? They have the feeling of unattractiveness and sometimes they are even depressed because of this disease. They may think, why did I develop this disease? What's wrong with me? Why this disease is not going away? I have tried everything, but still the disease is there, you know? This type of feeling may be there and the person may get depressed. So psoriasis can have this type of feature as well. Now let's move further. What are the common sites 
those are affected by psoriasis. I see here, psoriasis can affect any part of the body. Okay, typically scalp, elbow, knees, and sacral areas are commonly affected, which is very nicely shown in the picture. Scalp psoriasis is very common. Okay, hands, okay, palms, even sole. These are the knee, okay, elbow, and sacral area. These are quite common. Even the anterior part of the shin. These are the common one. Now, what are the clinical types of psoriasis? This is called classification or the types of psoriasis. The most common is called chronic plaque psoriasis, also known as classical type of psoriasis. This is the most common one. Another is called gutted type of psoriasis. The rounded or circular type of lesions are commonly seen. Flexural psoriasis means the folds are affected. Okay, folds. These are called flexural fold, like axilla and the groin. These are mainly involved. Erythrodermic psoriasis means very red looking lesions and multiple lesions are there. Large area of the skin is affected. This is erythrodermic type of psoriasis. Postular means small lesions which are filled with pus. These are actually the vesicle which are filled with pus. Okay, postular. These may be localized or generalized. Now, localize in some specific parts of the body. Generalize means almost everywhere. And some of the local forms also exist, like palm or plantar, when the palm and soles are affected, scalp is affected, or only the nails are affected. And this is known as psoriatic or onychodystrophy. Okay, nail, this term is for nail. And sometimes even the joints are affected, you know. This is known as psoriatic arthritis. So psoriasis are so many diverse type of presentation. Now, see here, the picture, okay, which you have seen in the beginning of this topic is the classical type of psoriasis or chronic plaque psoriasis, which is the most common one. So it is the most common type and it affects approximately 85% of the patient of psoriasis. And the features are, okay, well-defined plaque with silver color scale on the surface. And if we remove this uh, scale, the underlying surface is erythematous or a little bit pinkish type. Lesions may be single or numerous, okay? And plaque may involve large areas of the skin. So see, this area is a relatively bigger one. And classically, it affects the elbow or the back of the elbow knees, buttocks, scalp, and the anterior part of the tibia. Okay, though it is not written here, you can easily write it here. Uh, this is also quite common. Now see this, this is a classical, okay, psoriatic lesion. Now, if you have paid attention during the class, you know, if the same type of plaque you will examine in your patient, you always think about this disease. This is the beauty of dermatology. This is called morphological diagnosis. You don't need any uh, extra investigation for this. Yes, sometimes it is necessary because to rule out certain other differential diagnosis, I may need uh, the help of investigation. But for the confirmation of the disease itself, it is not necessary. Now, this is another picture of chronic plaque psoriasis. Look at this big plaque here, okay, rough appearance. Uh, probably the patient has applied some emollient, okay? So the, uh, the white silvery scales are not seen everywhere. It's still very classical appearance. And some other, see the chronic plaque psoriasis. Still this is plaque. Now this is, some other uh, types of manifestations, you know. See these rounded lesions, okay, rounded lesions, a relatively circular type of lesions. So we can call that gutted psoriasis, or sometimes it is highly confusing with the plaque psoriasis because these uh, lesions are fusing with each other and it almost looks like a plaque. Okay. The treatment is similar. 
in in this condition so it doesn't really matter much now chronic plaque psoriasis this is another picture here you can clearly see it's a big plaque okay uh, emollients have been applied probably but at the margin i can still see some of the plaques or flakes here now the second uh, types of uh, psoriasis on the list is called guttate type of psoriasis guttate form so here in this condition there are numerous and small lesions on the skin and they are roughly about 1 cm in diameter they are pink with less scale than the plaque psoriasis now see here they are small and they don't have much scales on the surface and they look pinkish to reddish commonly found on trunk and proximal part of the limbs and they are typically seen in individual who are less than 30 years and one very very common association is it is often preceded by an upper respiratory tract infection caused by streptococcal organism or group a beta hemolytic streptococci or streptococcus pyogenes usually that is tonsillitis or pharyngitis caused by that particular organism and and within few days the patient will develop this type of lesion the third variety on the you know types of psoriasis is flexural forms of psoriasis flexural form look at this axilla in this area okay this big psoriatic plaque is seen this is a flexural form what are the important points about the flexural form these are the lesions which develops in the skin folds particularly groin area axillary area gluteal cleft okay gluteal cleft near to the anal area or even the sub mammary region okay in case of female because that is also considered as a as a as a type of skin folds the important feature here the scale are minimal or absent they are minimal or absent now see there it it looks very reddish but i cannot see much uh, you know scales here and one of the reason for not having the enough scale is this area uh, you know uh, remains wet most of the time because of sweating it's a wet area you know so because of that wetness probably the scales are not uh, you know deposited there okay so it may cause uh, a diagnostic difficulty when genital or perianal region is affected in isolation uh, it can be easily confused with some other you know differential diagnosis like fungal infection okay that is the point now what is the another types of psoriasis uh, you know on our list that is erythrodermic psoriasis erythrodermic psoriasis now see that this erythrodermic psoriasis is a generalized form uh, where there is generalized erythema which covers the entire skin surface this looks very erythematous and if we see carefully on top of that erythematous surfaces there are silver colored plaque okay or scale as well patient may become febrile hypo or hyperthermic and dehydrated because of this condition now you can give certain reasons here why those people become febrile or hyperthermic why what what is the reason for that anybody skin are cracked or evaporation occur mm -hmm. okay that's a okay i'll explain uh, about that point anybody else bleeding may occur mm -hmm. now see here skin really infected see there now this hyperproliferative exactly will create high there's a hyperthermic very good now the points are coming excellent now see there this this uh, in this condition there is excessive turnover of the cell now this excessive turnover of the cell is a hypermetabolic state 
and in any type of hypermetabolic state you know the temperature is slightly elevated than the normal so especially in this erythrodermic which is the most serious type of psoriasis actually large body surface area is involved so that's why the patient may be febrile or hyperthermic but some of the people may become hypothermic also if there is extensive damage done to the skin and the flecking is lost very quickly you know then heat can be evaporated out of the body as well so this is the way to understand in medicine you know whatever we study in the book patient may not present like that always remember this so there may be different explanations for the presentation in the patient and dehydration can be explained again by the same way if the skin is extensively damaged you know there may be loss of the fluid from the skin complications of erythrodermic psoriasis include cardiac failure infection malabsorption and anemia now why why is that that is also or again sorry again explained by uh, some of the problem which occur on the skin there may be extensive connection between arterial system and the venous system okay these are av fistula formation in that affected area whenever the av fistula occurs there is a high chance of cardiac failure we have studied that before because uh, there is no capillary bed in the in between the arterial flow is in high speed all that blood will quickly go to the venous side and then there will be quick venous return on over a period of time heart may fail because of this phenomena infection because of skin damage malabsorption and anemia are explained by excessive you know cytokine release by that site this is known as cytokine storm and cytokine storm can have a lot of damage in different parts of the body fortunately this type of uh, psoriasis is relatively uncommon now see here look at the picture then you can understand it very easily see here this this uh, you know is a very closed view this is a magnified view but uh, a lot of information is provided here look at this plaque here scale okay scale i should say still white a little bit silver colored and this is the extensively red skin skin is already a little bit splitted here see now another type of uh, psoriasis is known as postular psoriasis postular there are two forms one is called localized form another is called generalized form the localized form is more common than the generalized and here patient presents as deep seated lesion with multiple small pustules on the palms and the soles along with some other parts of the body as well whereas in the generalized form it is associated with fever okay and there is wide spread pustule across the body with inflamed body surface means larger body surface area is affected and it is also known by another term which is known as von jambusk disease okay von jambusk disease this is another term for generalized form of postural psoriasis can be asked as mcq question in the exam sometimes now see here okay this is von jambusk disease postular form of psoriasis small post forming vesicles are present okay and there are a lot of you know scales i can see look at this area there this scale will give you a clue that this is a case of psoriasis now another variety is called palmo plantar form of psoriasis the palms and soles are affected here and if i pay attention very carefully it still has got that classical or a uh, plaque or scale there okay it can be hyper uh, keratotic or postular postular is a part of postular psoriasis it's a localized type of postular psoriasis and hyper keratotic type you can see on the picture it may mimic dermatitis or uh, you know sometimes we may look for some other manifestation of psoriasis you know to confirm the diagnosis 
and usually it is associated with some other manifestation of psoriasis like maybe the nails are affected okay maybe the joints of the hand are affected along with this so we know if you combine all these features together uh, this is a case of psoriasis in dermatitis the joints are not affected it is possibly aggravated by trauma so corner phenomena may be quite prominent here okay before i move further what is corner phenomena yes what is corner phenomena anyone inflammation on the head skin scalp leg psoriasis mm -hmm. so plug aggravated or exacerbated by trauma good very nice i'm just asking this question uh, to find out whether you are attentive or not okay because we we discussed this in the beginning of the class corner phenomena occurs in a genetically predisposed uh, person uh, with psoriasis if the on involved area is scratched or given slight trauma or if they suffer from some any type of injury then psoriatic plaque may develop at that site which did not have any psoriatic plaque before this is called corner phenomena now what is scalp psoriasis now see there look at this picture first look at this classical scale okay silver colored scale this this gives us the diagnosis otherwise a lot of differential diagnosis can be thought when this type of lesion comes it varies from minor scaling okay minor scaling with erythema to thick hyperkeratotic plaque as well so different types of presentations are there in scalp psoriasis it may extend beyond the hairline like this in the patient okay if this comes downwards you know then uh, it doesn't look good and this type of patient especially female this occurs in the female you know they this is they think this is cosmetically uh, you know ugly so they may isolate themselves and this type of disease is difficult to treat also in a short period of time so that will again you know cause a lot of concern in them patient scratching may produce asymmetrical plaque sometimes this is a itchy type of lesion sometimes not that as itchy as the fungal infection plaque or lesion but nevertheless it is itchy and when they scratch you know some of the plaque will disappear so it may look a bit asymmetrical as well now another type of manifestation is called nail psoriasis okay nail psoriasis now it may be present in patient with any type of psoriasis means any other type may be associated with nail psoriasis for example classical type of plaque psoriasis gutted form erythrodermic form palmoplantar form postular form any type may be associated with this it can take several forms pitting subangle hyperkeratosis form onycholysis form or oil drop sign so these are the different you know form of nail psoriasis here the pitting means there are well circumscribed depression on the nail surface and they are quite discrete okay the border are quite easily visible this is a pitting form slight depression on the surface of the nail other types are okay subangle type onycholysis and oil drop sign this now let's see some of the picture here you see this okay this nail doesn't look normal at all now see this how thick it is here and look at the typical appearance it almost looks like a psoriatic plaque here okay without any doubt anybody can think this is a form of psoriasis now see this okay these are the areas okay which are affected it starts from the free edge of the nail and slowly extending you know uh, proximally L look at here these are the ridges or the slight depression on the nail plate i can clearly see that okay so these are different forms of the uh, nail type psoriasis another one okay uh, sometimes it is easily confused with 
fungal infection of the nail for onychomycosis. And during that time, uh, how do you separate whether this is psoriasis or onychomycosis? How do you separate? Yes. Sir, we can do KOH mount. Excellent. You just clip the nail. Okay, nail can be clipped and sent to the lab. Ask for the KOH mount. And uh, if it shows fungal hyphae, okay, this is uh, onychomycosis. In nail psoriasis, we don't see that type of finding. And this is, see, it's a magnified view, which is again showing the involvement from the, you know, edge of the nail plate and slowly ascending proximally. Okay, so these are the different forms. Now, let's move further. Let's talk about another, you know, form of psoriasis that is called psoriatic arthritis. This is inflammation of the joint because of psoriasis. Now, look at this picture here first. Let's start from here. So, which joints are swollen here? Can you name those joints which are swollen? Yes. What can you see here? Okay, which joints are these? Interphalangeal joints. Interphalangeal joints. Interphalangeal joints. Which which interphalangeal? Which which interphalangeal? Proximal. 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 Excellent. These are proximal interphalangeal joints. P I P. These are called D I P. See this. These are not affected here, okay? But these are definitely swollen. Even the metacarpophalangeal joints are swollen. I can clearly see here, okay? These are the one, very good. Now, approximately five to 20% of the cases of psoriasis have associated arthritis. So we can see them. We have to look for the swollen you know, fingers. There are five major patterns of the psoriatic arthritis. One is distal interphalangeal joint involvement. Another is symmetrically polyarthritis. Okay. Another is psoriatic spondyloarthropathy. Spondylo means spine or the vertebral involvement. Arthritis mutilans is a destruction of the joint, is called mutilans. It's a severe form of psoriasis. And then oligoarticular asymmetrical arthritis. Four or less than four joint involvement is called oligoarticular. Polyarticular means more than that. Okay, so these are the different forms. This oligoarticular or symmetrical polyarthritis can involve any joint like this PIP or any other joint uh, in that regard. Clinical expression often overlap. Okay, each, each of these conditions may overlap with each other. Now, there are lots of differential diagnosis which, which should be considered if uh, joints are swollen like that. One of the important is a rheumatoid arthritis. Now, what extra feature you have seen here so that you know this is a case of psoriasis? Any extra feature you have noticed on this, on this hand? Yes, please look carefully. Why this is a case of psoriasis, not rheumatoid arthritis? So look at the nails. Let's look at the finger, sir. No Look at the nails here. Look at the nails. Very good. See this? These nails are also pathological. In rheumatoid arthritis, we don't see this type of nails. Okay. So if I combine this finger, this feature, and this swelling of the joints together, the first thing that comes in my mind is psoriasis. But still, I may need to help of some of the investigation later on. Excellent. So look, look for other features of psoriasis. And uh, some of the students are answering, the joints are not deformed. Remember, the deformity of the joint occurs late in rheumatoid arthritis, not early, okay? Let's move on. Now, after uh, discussing all these different types or forms of the psoriasis, let's talk about how to diagnose it. Now, psoriasis is a clinical diagnosis, okay? By a good examination, we can diagnose it clinically because of the appearance, because of the distribution, because of the history of lesions and family history and all those things will help us in the process. And one of the important point of diagnosis is other dermatological disorders resemble psoriasis, so they should be ruled out one after other. Okay. So let's talk about 
what are the differential diagnosis of psoriasis and why ruling them out is so important before we finalize our diagnosis. There's a big list here. These all can be considered as a differential diagnosis of psoriasis. If it is a localized plaque form or patches form, then tinea may be confused with psoriatic lesion. Tinea is a dermatophyte infection. Eczema or dermatitis is another one. Superficial basal cell carcinoma and Bowen's disease can be considered. Okay, especially if it occurs on the face. Uh, you know, basal cell carcinoma is very common on the face. Bowen's disease is a basal cell carcinoma in C2. Seborrheic dermatitis, cutaneous T cell lymphoma, which is known as mycosis fungoids. This term is highly, you know, confusing. Mycosis is the term we use for the fungal infection, but it is not a fungal infection. It's a type of lymphoma. Okay, it, it, it may resemble that, but it is not clearly the fungal infection. So you need to be careful. Gutted form of psoriasis may be confused with pityriasis rosea, where there is a herald patch, a big, you know, lesions, which is appearing first, and then other small lesions would be there. Drug eruption, okay, drug eruption, different types of rashes appear in drug eruption. Uh, uh, these may be, you know, uh, uh, maybe macular rashes, maybe papular rashes, there may be target lesion, there may be vesicular lesions, okay, different types. And secondary syphilis, we have recently talked about that. Extensive maculopapular involvement may be there. Flexural form of psoriasis may be confused with tinea. Now, which type of tinea is usually confused with flexural psoriasis? Yes, which tinea will be that? Anybody? If it occurs in the groin area, which type of tinea is there? What, what is the name? Tinea, tinea cruris. Exactly. Tinea cruris. Tinea cruris. Very good. Tinea cruris is the uh, you know inguinal type of tinea or dermatophyte infection, eczema, and candidiasis. This is known as candidal intertrigo. Candidal intertrigo, which is commonly you know uh, seen there, and even seborrheic dermatitis. It is associated with seborrhea. Erythrodermic type of uh, you know psoriasis may be confused with eczema or dermatitis again. Cutaneous tissue lymphoma, if it is extensive one, and some of the drug reactions like Steven Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis. And palmoplantar psoriasis is easily confused with tinea once again, because tinea can, can affect those type of reasons. Now, in the subsequent slide, we'll talk about how to separate each of them. Now, localized patch or plaque type of psoriasis is very commonly confused with tinea corporis. Okay, please correct the spelling here. Corporis, R is missing here. So see this, this is psoriasis, this is tinea corporis. Okay, just uh, for the first time when you look, you know, it almost looks a bit similar, but if you pay attention, there are some important differences. Look at the central key clearing of the lesion. At the center, the lesion is clear and it is extending towards the A's or towards the periphery. This is typical of tinea or dermatophyte lesion. So this is very, very important point. Now, discoid eczema, a type of eczema, it's called discoid or disc separate eczema or rounded eczema, okay? This may be confused with localized patch or plaque, but in eczema, usually, okay, usually there are no scales present, or there are no flecks present. Like see there, it is uh, no flecking here, but this is a psoriatic plaque. See this, very classical, okay? The, the scales or flecks are still seen. Seborrheic dermatitis is another one, especially if it occurs on the scalp or on the base of the neck we are easily confused. So this is seborrheic dermatitis. Uh, here is psoriasis. In seborrheic dermatitis, these uh, you know, scales are tightly attached on the underlying skin. And these are greasy in nature. Greasy, oily. Greasy means oily. Okay, They look slightly yellowish also. 
and psoriasis is a classical you know silver or white color scale so this is an important point now cutaneous tissue lymphoma or mycosis fungoids okay is another a differential diagnosis this is how mycosis fungoids look but with with this type of observation i can never confirm it probably i should take the biopsy here okay this is called tissue lymphoma of the skin and this is a classical psoriasis now in case of gutted type of psoriasis it is confused with pityriasis rosea so this is gutted form of psoriasis and this is called pityriasis rosea this is known as herald patch okay herald patch and it has got christmas tree distribution so very diffuse type of distribution and it results over 8 to 12 weeks and one of the important pathophysiology for this is a immunological phenomena again now gutted psoriasis may be confused with secondary syphilis so this patient is having secondary syphilis rashes macular rashes papular rashes even vesicular and postular rashes may be seen in secondary syphilis apart from them what are the other features of secondary syphilis okay we have recently discussed about that yes can you tell me other features anybody what do you mean by Okay, I think I was a bit of you know offline, but now I think it's it's okay. Can you see me now? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. yes. So, can you tell me what are the other features of secondary syphilis apart from these rashes? Yes. What are the other features? Sir, there is a non-tender generalized lymphadenopathy. Good. And, and there is you, much hidden appearance on the scalp. Good. This is alopecia. Very good. Which is known as moth hidden appearance. Good. And what is condyloma later? What is that? What do you mean by that? Condyloma. Good type of lesion. A gray layer on the inner gray. thigh. Upper part of the thigh and enogenital area. Very good. Both of you are absolutely correct. This is a wet type of patch, which is present in the upper part of the thigh or near to the genital or anal area. And this is highly contagious. So these are the different way by which we diagnose secondary syphilis. And this is how we distinguish it from gutted type psoriasis. Now, flexural types of psoriasis is very easily confused with tinea infection called as tinea cruris. See, this is tinea cruris and this is a psoriasis still i can see a bit of silver colored scale here if you pay attention and uh, here you know uh, nothing like that can be seen now atopic eczema may be confused with flexural type of psoriasis atopic eczema is very common in small babies look at this uh, you know presentation atopic eczema okay if it occurs on the flexural area then it may be uh, confused with flexural psoriasis atopic eczema is an example of type 1 hypersensitivity reaction and this is a very itchy type of condition candidiasis is also confused with flexural psoriasis this is known as candidal intertrypo okay now here a big uh, you know main lesion is there and on the you know border there may be satellite lesion Okay, satellite lesion, which are called as a peripheral lesion. Sometimes they are postular as well. And even seborrheic dermatitis can be confused with flexural form of psoriasis. Now, palmo plantar psoriasis is uh, confused with tinea manum. Okay, tinea manum, a type of tinea infection or dermatophyte infection. This is another point. Again, the differentiation is so easy. Okay, it may be a part of tinea corporis, or we call it tinea manum specifically. And uh, this is psoriasis, very classical, and we cannot see this type of lesion here. Tinea manum also affects the dorsal surface of the hand, also. 
now hand and foot eczema okay this is eczema which is occurring in the specifically on the hand and foot and this is typical psoriasis both looks hyperkeratotic but still you know this picture is so classical rather than this and there is loss of the skin here there is deposition of flake so these are the different point now all of these differential diagnosis okay we have to sort it out now after that let's talk about what lab study you can do in a case of psoriasis so i already told you for the purpose of diagnosis itself you know psoriasis is a clinical diagnosis but for the sake of you know differentiation from other differential diagnosis we may we need to go for certain test so rheumatoid factor is negative here because one of the important differential diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis is rheumatoid arthritis so rheumatoid factor is negative here esr is usually normal except in postular and erythrodermic psoriasis when they are highly inflammatory then only esr will be high otherwise esr is within normal limit uric acid level may be elevated in psoriasis again in postular psoriasis and erythrodermic psoriasis because of the high turnover of the cells in a large surface area so remember in this condition the nucleic acid will undergo into uric acid pathway so uric acid is formed in a higher amount and that uric acid may be deposited in the uh, joint as uric acid crystal and that condition is known as gout so gout may be confused with psoriatic arthritis fluid from pustules is sterile with neutrophilic infiltrate if we draw the pustular fluid okay and then if evaluate it it is sterile with neutrophilic infiltrate sterile means there is no microorganisms present there are no bacteria present you know this pustule or pus is purely by neutrophil perform fungal study if you want to differentiate it from the tinea group of infection or dermatophyte infection that is kos mount if you are starting systemic therapy like immunological inhibitors then consider obtaining the baseline lab study like complete blood count blood urea nitrogen and serum creatinine liver function test hepatitis panel and tuberculosis screening because if these are you know uh, infections are there in the body like hepatitis or tb they may get flared up by using this drug the person may even get more sicker or if they are in the dormant state the person may become manifested by the disease now and these drug have a lot of side effects in the bone marrow in the liver or even in the kidney so it is better to know what is the baseline test before we use the drug so that we can always compare it later on okay so these tests are uh, you know done in this type of condition let's move on now if we take a biopsy from the skin lesion of psoriasis what we see there see here okay what is the biopsy report if we take it may reveal basal cell hyperplasia definitely because it is all about hyperproliferation of the cell and basal cell is the you know place from where everything starts proliferation of sub epidermal vasculature because of that the pinpoint hemorrhage can occur when we you know scratch that site there is absence of normal cell maturation because everything is happening so fast and there is excessive keratinization a large number of activated t cells are also present in the epidermis so these are seen in the biopsy if you take x ray of the affected joint you may see different features of arthritis means the increase in joint space can be seen okay later on in case of mutilans type of psoriatic arthritis 
the joint surface may be destroyed. Conjunctival impression cytology has demonstrated an increased incidence of squamous metaplasia and neutrophil clumping in this condition. So this is one of the extra investigation which can be done. And when the scales are removed, okay, either by scratching, okay, or by a small type of trauma, a small droplets of the blood appear within a few seconds from the exposed vessels in case of you know dry, trauma or scratching. This is known as ospid sign. So I have been describing it right from the beginning. So this is the ospid sign. Very important question from the exam point of view. Remember, ospid sign is present in psoriasis. So how we do that? We take a coin. Okay, when the patient comes to us, we take a coin. We scratch uh, that area. Okay, that is known as Grattez test. Grattez, okay, test means scratch that area with coin. And within second, you know, you can see pinpoint bleeding or hemorrhage from that area. The whole thing is called auspice sign. Now, the last part is the management. Oh, this is a big discussion and uh, please pay attention. A lot of questions can be asked in the dermatology exam from here, okay? So how to manage psoriasis? Now, the first thing we want to know is management is really difficult here because this is a chronic skin condition where there is frequent remission and relapses going on. So patient uh, needs a prolonged type of treatment and patient should uh, you know, build a good trust, okay, a relation with the doctor filled with trust so that the patient keep on coming to the same doctor in the future. If they keep on changing the doctor, you know, treatment is really a problem. So establish relationship of trust with the patient. Explain everything what is happening with the patient, how drugs are working. If they are not working, you tell that directly to the patient, you know, and do not uh, give them false hope. Provide patient with information. Emphasize the benign nature of the disease and explain that psoriasis tends to be chronic and recurrent. Do not you know, lie to the patient, give all the information to the patient. And the best thing is, yeah, you know, if you have a small booklet, okay, or some information which is printed, give that to the patient to read or study. And next time when they come back, Okay, you can ask, uh, if there are any doubt from your side, you can ask me now. So this is a good way. Now, determine the clinical setting before selecting the treatment. Okay, and we need to consider all these things here. Consider the disease pattern, severity, and extent. What type of disease pattern is there? Is it localized form of psoriasis or a generalized form? Is it postular psoriasis or plaque type of psoriasis? Okay, all those things should be, uh, you know, diagnosed first. Where are the sites of disease? We need to examine it and find it out. Are there any coexisting medical condition or not in the patient? Very, very important one. If the patient is having some infection in the body, you know, probably we cannot use those powerful medicine. We need to treat the infection first. Patient's perception of the disease severity is important. What the patient is thinking about this disease, okay? Sometimes patients take it very seriously. They think this disease is incurable. Sometimes patient takes it very lightly. This is nothing. So you need to exactly explain or know what the patient is thinking. Time commitment and treatment expense, okay? Is also very, very important point to consider and explain to the patient. It's a expensive type of treatment because long time treatment is necessary and patient needs to give a lot of time to the doctor. Previous treatment history, if it is there, we should consider it. What medicine they have used before? What is the response of that medicine to the patient? Why the patient has changed the doctor? What is their you know, expectation? Everything matters when we start the therapy. Now, 
these are the treatment options for psoriasis step wise approach is always advisable okay step wise so we start with probably that medicine which is you know localized or locally acting we we do not start with a very you know powerful medicine in the beginning this is known as step wise approach treatments include general measures and topical therapy this topical is localized therapy then phototherapy and then only systemic and biological therapy so this is known as step wise approach okay so our treatment also you know uh, our treatment or management part also discusses all those things combination therapy may be necessary in many people it may reduce toxicity and improve the outcome like topical therapy with phototherapy or with a combination of some systemic therapy this is the approach which is uh, you know followed by some of the dermatologists and other strictly follow the step wise approach they start with the topical therapy and they go slowly on the other type now look at this uh, you know treatment these are the treatment options for psoriasis these are the different types of topical therapy or topical treatment the second one is phototherapy and the third one is systemic therapy like oral or injected medicines are taken and these are the topical drugs topical steroid very important part of the treatment vitamin d analog anthraline type of compound topical retinoids vitamin a derivative calcineurin inhibitor like tacrolimus salicylic acid coal tar and different type of moisturizers or emollients these all comes under topical treatment the important one we are going to talk uh, one after other okay the second groups of treatment are phototherapy like sunlight just exposure to sunlight regularly ultraviolet b therapy it can be done in the medical center or hospital and we combine one particular drug which is known as soralen and then we give phototherapy okay the combination of this is called puva see this soralen this p is soralen plus ultraviolet a light is uva so we call it puva therapy also known as photochemotherapy so this is also one of the important types or step of the treatment now finally oral or injected medicines are used and like uh, retinoids okay specifically they are taken by the oral route powerful types of drug methotrexate okay you all have heard the name before this is a very powerful drug this is this drug is also known as anti cancer drug or anti metabolite a lot of other conditions are also treated by methotrexate can you name some of them where methotrexate is used for the treatment purpose yes rheumatoid rheumatoid arthritis rheumatoid arthritis very good very good answer yes anything else osteoporosis maybe another condition is leukemia remember leukemia and some other malignancy methotrexate is used for the treatment so uh, psoriasis rheumatoid arthritis okay and uh, um, leukemia and certain other malignancy methotrexate so can be a important question in the exam cyclosporine is very powerful okay immunosuppressive drug which can be used for different other situation also it can be used as well here yeah. and biologics drugs that alter the immune system like infliximab and some other monoclonal antibody so this is slide is very important uh people, the teacher regularly asks this question to you now let's start with the discussion what are the general measures that can be you know that can be important in the treatment part or we have to explain this to the patient party 
reduce or eliminate the potential triggering factor. Now, in the beginning of the class, we talked about this triggering factor like stressful situation, smoking and alcohol consumption, avoid trauma to the skin because of Kobner phenomena, the disease may develop there. Okay, certain drugs and infection patients should protect themselves from this thing. Otherwise, you know, uh, psoriasis, rashes or plaque may develop. Now, others are the topical therapy. Okay. Which type of uh, topical therapy we are going to use and what is the important principle? Approximately 70% of the patient with mild to moderate psoriasis can be managed with topical therapy alone. Very important point. Okay, see there? Almost 70% of them can be managed with topical therapy alone. And topical therapy is very easy to apply. Patient motivation may affect the compliance. It is easier to do, but they have to do it all the time, you know, every day for a longer duration. So patient motivation is important one. You have to explain the whole situation to the patient party also, like the family member. If patient is not motivated, the family member should persuade this or convince the patient to apply the medicine. Application may be time consuming for patient. So motivation is really important. Now, one of the important topical therapy is called emollients. Emollients. Now, these emollients are applied on the lesion, okay, so that they, okay, are, you know, free of pruritus. These emollients, they elevate pruritus or extensive itching there. They also reduce the scale on the surface of the lesion. If we use these emollients along with some other topical therapy, then enhancement of the penetration of topical therapy is increased by using this, uh, you know, uh, emollients like petrolatum jelly is one of the example. So let me tell you once again, if I use petrolatum jelly in the beginning on those classical type of you know plaque and after a certain time if i use other topical therapy the penetration of the topical therapy would be better after using emollients these emollients hydrate the dry and cracked skin as well so uh, these have got important role to play but remember soap should be avoided because soap made that area dry we want to use some moisturizing agent we don't want those agents which will keep the or make that area dry. Now, another types of topical agents or, or drugs are called keratolytic drugs. Now, keratolytic, okay, these are the drugs which removes the fleck or the scale. These are the drugs which are available over the counter, okay, means. You don't need a prescription of a doctor to buy this drug. But in our part of the world, we, we don't need a prescription to buy any drug, isn't it? That's a different thing. So this is the point where uh, there is a you know, prescription necessary to buy the drug. But these, these don't need any prescription, like salicylic acid and urea are the keratolytic agent. They help dissolve keratin to soften and lift the psoriasis scale. And they also enhance the penetration of other drugs. So this is one of the option, okay, in case of topical therapy. Now, one of the most important topical therapy which is used in the treatment is called coal tar. Coal tar. Now this coal tar help to reduce inflammation and pruritus. So it is anti-inflammatory substance. It inhibits the deregulated epidermal proliferation and dermal infiltration by the T cells also. So this is really helpful if we consider the pathophysiology and it may induce longer remission. So this is a commonly used drug, okay, or topical therapy in the treatment of psoriasis. But there are some uh, drawbacks also. One is its, its distinctive smell, okay, 
smell is not that good and it can stain the cloth and skin as well as well as it can lead to skin irritation it is not very desirable by the patient now we're talking about uh, different types of topical therapy before the break we talk about cold tar so it is one of the commonly used topical therapy now, another one on the list is dithranol okay it is known as dithranol see here this dithranol has an anti proliferative property just like uh, cold tar and it is particularly effective in thick plaque type of psoriasis and this is the most common type of psoriasis this is also known as classical type it initiate therapy at a very low concentration okay means you don't uh, you know give this at a high concentration for the patient because it can burn skin this is one of the side effect of dithranol and because of the same reason it is not suitable for face flexural areas or genital on the face and genital the skin is very thin and in the flexural area uh, you know uh, because of the wetness most of the time the flecking are not that very prominent so because of constant friction and inflammation the skin is thin there also so this uh, drug is not suitable on the site and it can stain clothes permanently and skin temporarily a bit like cold tar okay so these are some of the points regarding dithranol let's move on Now, another type of drug is called tazarotene. Okay, tazarotene is vitamin A derivative. Okay, it's a type of retinoid prodrug. So, prodrug means it will be converted to active form inside the body. Okay, when it goes inside the body, then the active form will be uh, formed. That's known as prodrug. so it modulates the differentiation and proliferation of epithelial tissue that is a function of vitamin a okay vitamin a is very necessary for the normal health of epithelial tissue that what it does and it is also anti inflammatory and immunomodulatory you know in function remember active inflammation is going on at that area because of t cell t cell collection so it really helps it is more commonly used for facial lesion that is a you know tazarotene a form of uh, topical therapy see there let me underline this it is also used commonly for the treatment of chronic plaque type of psoriasis it is applied once daily in the evening time and it also commonly causes local irritation so many of the drugs which are used for the topical purpose are causing uh, irritation of the skin that also means you know the drugs are working there okay means they are penetrating in the deeper part of the skin so we should explain this to the patient party otherwise they think this is a side effect of the drug and they may discontinue it now after tazarotene okay another very very commonly used drugs are topical corticosteroids topical corticosteroid so they possess anti inflammatory anti proliferative and immunomodulatory property we all know that they are very powerful you know type of drugs so anti inflammatory anti proliferative and immunomodulatory property they reduce the superficial inflammation within the plaque and the potency of this drug depends on the disease severity location of the lesion and patient's preference but um, a more important points than the patient preference are disease severity and the location means if the uh, thick skins are affected and if those plaques are quite thick then i will choose moderately potent to highly potent type of corticosteroids if the skin is quite thin okay then i will choose you know less potent type of corticosteroid now in the clinical practice there are so many different types of corticosteroids available can you name some of them yes can you name the corticosteroid prednisolone 
Very good. So most of the names are, have already come here. Uh, Pranisholon, okay. Then uh, Methyl Pranisholon, uh, Dexamethason, Beta Methason, Hydrocortisone, okay. Clobitasol, isn't it? Momitason, so many different types are there. Some are highly potent, some are less potent. So uh, Pranisolone is mainly available as an oral form. Methyl prednisolone is available as an injectable form, whereas dexamethasone, betamethasone, clobitasol, and hydrocortisones are available in the different forms. So we can choose according to the you know, choice what we want for the patient. Now, what are the adverse effects of this corticosteroid if they are used for a long duration? A very important question. Okay, and many of the students know it already. Though those these corticosteroids are used topically, you know, but it depends on what is the inflammatory state of the lesion. If the lesions are a bit highly inflamed, then the corticosteroid may get absorbed in the body and they may cause a bit more toxicity. And another is how long you have used that. If you have used it for a longer time, then toxicity will be higher. Like skin atrophy and telangiectasia, these are dilated superficial blood vessels which are seen because of skin atrophy. Hypopigmentation, stri, okay, stri, a bit of splitting of the skin because of decreased protein synthesis there. Rapid relapse or a rebound on stopping the therapy. That's why we should not, you know, stop them suddenly. Precipitation of the postular forms of psoriasis is one of the drawback of long-term corticosteroid. And then uh, pituitary adrenal axis suppression, or you can call it hypothalamo pituitary adrenal axis suppression. But from the local application, this type of suppression is a bit rare, but it all depends on how much of the surface is inflamed, how much drug is absorbed inside the body. It depends on that. Now, another type of topical therapy is vitamin D analog. Okay, vitamin D analog or synthetic vitamin D analog. And one of the example is calcipotriol. Calcipotriol. So let's talk a bit about it. Vitamin D analogs are used in the patient with lesion which are resistant to topical therapy or with lesion on the face or exposed area where thinning of the skin would pose cosmetic problem. Now, all those medicine which were applied before, okay, they make us burning sensation on the skin and they are more preferably used, okay, on the thicker skin except dithranol, except. So synthetic vitamin D analog has a role to play. It regulates skin cell production and development. Remember in psoriasis, the skin cell production is very fast. So it is regulating that. It also inhibits epidermal proliferation. It promotes keratocyte or keratinocyte differentiation and has immunosuppressive effect on the lymphoid cells. So all the features are beneficial regarding the treatment. It is trying to normalize the keratinocyte differentiation and growth there. At the same time, the lymphoid cell, the T lymphocytes which are present there, it is inhibiting them. For chronic plaque psoriasis, okay, it is very commonly used and response may require four to six weeks. So patient counseling is really important here. Otherwise they will leave the uh, you know, treatment process in the, in the middle. And adverse effect include erythema and irritation which are not very severe one. So uh, we can you know, withstand this uh, small type of adverse effect. But remember, you need to explain everything to the patient. Now, we have uh, discussed many different types of topical or local therapy. If we, if we want to list them once again, remember emollients therapy, okay, are the first one probably, emollients like petrolatum jelly, okay, or petrolatum cream. 
petroleum jelly also you can say then some keratolytic agent like salicylic acid or urea okay those are the compound then we can go for different types of you know topical therapy like coal tar coal tar okay very commonly used though it has a not a it, it doesn't have a good smell or it, it has a staining property on the skin and a bit of burning sensation also then dithranol is another type of therapy okay tazarotene is another type of therapy okay then vitamin d analog like calcipotriol is another type of therapy so all these we can use here now apart from them some other therapies which are used in the treatment of psoriasis are phototherapy systemic therapy and biological therapy this biological therapy is a part of systemic therapy itself now what do we mean by phototherapy here for psoriasis which is resistant to the topical therapy and the psoriatic plaque which cover more than 10% of the body surface area we are are going for phototherapy this is one of the important part of the treatment it has got immunomodulatory and anti inflammatory effect so it really helps the patient there are three main types of phototherapy here one is called broad band ultraviolet b another is called narrow band ultraviolet b and third is called puva okay this puva is a combination of soralen with ultraviolet a see this p u v a okay so in short form we call it puva this this soralen is a photosensitizer drug so this drug is given first to the patient patient ingests that drug and after certain time the patient is you know exposed to the light okay in the hospital you know there are some chamber the light chamber which are already present there or phototherapy chamber you can say patient you know, will be kept inside that chamber and then it will emit the ultraviolet b light or ultraviolet a after taking uh, soralen treatment is usually administered two to three times a week so remember so many of the patients they they are working they don't have you know free time always so they may you know give or two to three hours to the treatment process okay in one, in a week they we, we cannot tell them can you please go outside to the sunshine and stay there throughout the day because they, they don't have time for that so this type of therapy which is done in the hospital is really important and some other type of patients who are quite free okay and uh, they are staying at home most of the time they can simply expose themselves to the natural sunlight that is also helpful in this treatment now other therapies are systemic therapy now they are reserved okay for the patient with widespread or severe psoriasis and if you want to take example of widespread or severe type of psoriasis then definitely erythrodermic psoriasis is one of them a generalized postular type of psoriasis is another one okay they are considered more severe type than the other now these are very powerful drug so they have serious adverse effect and they also have multiple drug interaction if other drugs are given together okay so in different countries okay before we start this drug we have to follow pharmaceutical benefit scheme okay or patient is already patient have already taken that type of scheme you know this is a a benefit special type of scheme so that they may get certain subsidiary from the government also okay uh, so that the treatment is affordable otherwise this type of treatments if they are used for a longer time are very expensive for the patient Now, what are these drugs let's talk uh, some important one only methotrexate is one of the very commonly used drug uh, uh, in this regard methotrexate now see here this is most commonly used systemic treatment for psoriasis and this methotrexate interfere with dna synthesis dna repair and cellular replication if you go into detail 
about the mechanism of action of uh, methotrexate, then it will inhibit the folic acid okay, synthesis inside the cell. It acts on actively proliferating tissues, uh, okay, like this keratinocyte, which are actively proliferating here, but it doesn't you know, only act in them. That is a problem with methotrexate. It can act any rapidly proliferating cells inside the body. Even the normal cells are inhibited okay, by methotrexate. And that's why methotrexate has a lot of side effects. Okay? That is the way you have to understand here. It may act on the bone marrow. It may act on the epithelial cells of the GI tract. Okay, it may act on the hair cells. It may also act on the kidney, liver, and other organ. And it may have a lot of side effects. Now, before, okay, we use methotrexate, one of the important point I like to share with you is basic blood test. Okay, liver function test and renal function test. This has to be done so that if some uh, adverse effect or side effect is developed by the patient later on, we can always compare it. Yes, the patient was having that before. And now, after using this drug, patient is developing this problem. Okay? So, these are really important one. And every two weeks, I need to repeat the CBC. Now, after two weeks of use of methotrexate, uh, if the counts are very low, if the patient develops pancytopenia, then we already know this is because of the medicine. Okay, if it is very, very low, probably we have to switch the therapy also. This is an immunosuppressive condition. We cannot keep the patient like that. Now, another important drug is cyclosporine. Cyclosporine is a specific modulator of T cell function and an agent that depresses cell mediated immune response by inhibiting the helper T cell function. And in this condition, the T cells are hyperactive and they are collected in large amount okay, in the dermal area of the skin. It is considered one of the important immunosuppressive agent. For patients with severe psoriasis, that is refractory to other treatment, we have to use cyclosporine. This is never the first line. It's a very powerful drug and very expensive drug also, so not used as the first line. And just like methotrexate, we have to monitor the blood element that is a complete blood count test, renal and liver function test has to be done. Now, another type of drug which is uh, coming under systemic therapy is known as acetretine. Acetretine, it is a type of vitamin A derivative again. So this is an oral type of retinoid, okay, oral retinoid. And this is used for the treatment of all forms of severe psoriasis. So this is a good drug to use in severe type of psoriasis. It is a systemic type of drug. Once daily oral therapy is given, and we need to rule out pregnancy if you are using this drug if the patient is female, because this is a teratogenic drug. We should not use this in pregnancy, pregnant state. Now, we have come towards the end of this important topic. So what are the biological agents? Uh, those are used for the treatment of psoriasis. These biological agents are the proteins which are derived from uh, living organisms that exert the pharmacological action. These are called biological agents, like uh, you know, uh, monoclonal antibodies and things like that. Anti-tumor necrosis factor, okay? Those are the different ones. They are expensive type of therapy, Many of them are still in the trial basis, okay, or experimental phase. And these are given for those patients, okay, where a treatment has failed even after phototherapy or other systemic therapy. And most of these are administered subcutaneously. These are biological agents. Now, let's, let's talk a little bit about them. You see that? These biological agents, they target the key parts of the immune system which drive the psoriasis means the cytokine. They, they, they target the cytokine which are involved in the 
pathophysiology and some of them are see here a uh, tumor uh, necrosis factor alpha inhibitor and interleukin inhibitor like etanercept adalimumab and infliximab okay these are tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitors and ustekinumab is a interleukin inhibitor a bit difficult type of pronunciation but you know uh, we can guess because many of them ends with a b or ab at the end so these are called monoclonal antibodies and they are a type of biological agents which targets different type of cytokines and by targeting that cytokine they can control the disease process they are not only used here they are used in so many other conditions also like any inflammatory conditions can be treated by them these days okay 